and prayer. I ask everybody to close your eyes if you're comfortable and just let yourself begin to feel the presence of the solitude and the silence. And know that we too are peaceful, we're calm. It is a time to regenerate and reflect. This is a time to relax. This is a time to peacefully and joyfully experience the dawn of a new day in spirit and in faith. We take a deep breath and release any negative thought thinking, any doubts, any fears, anything that blocks our unlimited ability to be healthy, free, and alive with new opportunities for increased faith, love, joy, fun, and laughter. We gently release the questions of our hearts, trusting the answers we seek to be there. We know deeply that you, God, are there. We recognize you. You are the true light, and we have faith in you, God, to gently guide us each step of the way. We rest in the silence of this comfort in God's eternal presence. There is a new awakening in our mind and bodies to the powerful healing light of God. We acknowledge God's healing presence, and we look forward to the dawning of greater energy, strength, and vitality. The healing light of God is working in every area of our bodies, and we are renewed and restored. We relax in this experience of the healing power of God, and we rest in the silence of this prayer. As we bring this sacred time to a close, we begin to experience a new dawn, a new awareness in our spirituality. As the new day dawns once again in our hearts, we celebrate the light that fills us and fills our world. God's complete and perfect illumination surrounds each of us. The umbrella of God's pure love covers us and God's power protects us and leads us from all harm. The presence of God watches over us 
every moment of the day and night. We are in God, and God is in us, and all is well. In the name and through the power of God, we pray. Amen. beginning to uh, listen to us and we invite you to this beautiful family here for the day we're speaking about change and we welcome all of you we're happy to have you that you're listening from home or wherever you are and thank you and always remember the namaste appreciates anything that we can do together to sustain all this beautiful family so thank you so today we are talking about change and when I started to think about it I really looked at it, which is not the way we always look at change. Change, when we seek it, empowers us. Change, when it's thrust upon us, scares us. And it throws us into something called the void. So today we're looking at that, and I'm going to read Ecclesiastics 3, chapter 1, uh, to begin with. It's one of my favorite passages. Um, that says, for everything there is a season, and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow. And there's many more things that it speaks about, which is war and peace, and all of the darkness and the light that comes together. But the one thing that keeps coming back is that if we can begin to look at change, daily change, as opportunities, we begin to soar. But it's difficult in the moment when we're thrust with some of life's challenges to begin to see ourselves able to see the opportunity in it. And what usually happens is we start to gossip, we start to get afraid, we start to talk about the negativity. And there's a wonderful story that I'd like to tell about Charlie Jones. I really didn't know who Charlie Jones was until I started to look this up. And I did remember that I had heard him on the, on the TV before. He was a very well-respected broadcaster for NBC. And he had a job kept, uh, covering the Olympics. And he loved what he did in the beginning because he began to, uh, was hired to follow and to be the broadcaster for the track and field events. But one day his boss came to him and said, we're no longer going to use you for the track and field events. And we are going to be placing you and assigning you to a new area, the swimming and the diving. Number one, he knew nothing about it. And number two, it was definitely to him a less than to be able to be part of the broadcasting of the diving and the swimming. So he developed an attitude. He was angry. He was frustrated. And everyone began to see this change in attitude. And so a friend came up to him one day and he said to him, can I be honest with you and tell you the truth of what I see? And of course, they were good friends, and he was willing to listen. He said, we have been watching you change for a long, long time, and we don't like what we're seeing. You're negative, you appear to be angry, and it's showing up in your broadcasting. 
And I'm afraid that if you don't do something about it, that you're going to lose your job. So Charlie at the time began to get scared because the loss of a job, as you well know, the Olympics broadcasters are paid a lot of money. And so beginning to look at and see that, you know, that what was really going on is he began to look at himself and he really felt unappreciated. That when they lessened what he thought was the events that he should be broadcasting at, that he felt that when they moved him, that he wasn't as worthy as he was when he was out there with the uh, track and field events. And so he took a look at that and said, you know what, I'm going to start looking at what's possible for me that I'm not seeing today. He changed his attitude, came into work, a much more cheerier person, and he began to enjoy doing the diving and the swimming. People around him started to notice something had changed in Charlie. And all of a sudden, he really learned the two sports. He started to study the individuals, and he began to want to get to know who they were instead of just broadcasting an event. And so he personalized what he was doing in the broadcasting by becoming in relationship with the divers and the swimmers. And he began to see the people that were so powerful that were doing swimming for the USA and the other divers and the swimmers, how powerful they were as people and how hard it was for any of the athletes to go to any event from the, in the Olympics. And so all of a sudden, his new boss started to notice his new attitude. He started to notice that, you know, Charlie was really changing. And so he went up to Charlie and said they were considering him to begin to be hired to do different events and eventually back into sports. And so Charlie began to notice that as he enjoyed what he did more, that his personality changed. He began to get feel younger and he began to feel more success than he had ever dreamed of. And so when the day ended, Charlie was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame called the Broadcaster's Alley. One of the few broadcasters that ever made it to be able to be in the Olympic, to be chosen to be in this Hall of Fame. And so I looked at that story and I thought how many of us are constantly being challenged with something new that we think that we don't deserve or that we're not being appreciated, whether it's just being a parent, whether it's just being a partner in a relationship, where we're not feeling appreciated and we're not feeling as if people recognize the job that we're trying to do. So when we look at it, and I thought about that, I started thinking, what did Charlie have to do? He had to die a certain death. A death to an old way of living that he was used to. Something that said, this is when you feel important and when you're over here, you, you're stripped of your importance. And so what he recognized is it had nothing to do with that. It had nothing to do with his boss, and it had nothing to do with the job, and it had everything to do with the job that he was doing internally. And so what he did is, what did he do? He changed himself. He began to live a new way. And so ironically, when we look at it, change is one of the first characteristics in order to grow. We have to be moved out of our comfort zone. We don't, you know, the people that we love that show all that love back to us, that's not where our work is. Our work is where the powerful people out there that push our buttons. That's the only way that we get pushed to grow and begin to see that life could be a different way. And what do we have to change? We have to change and die of a lot of the old. Old techniques, old messages, old self-worth, things that we valued in a different way. And so when we look at change now, what I see is growth. What I see is to live is to grow. Because once we stop giving water to plants, and once we stop watering ourselves, a certain part of us starts to die. I think we all know that. So to grow is to change, whether it's a plant or whether it's a human being. Jesus of Nazareth said to his disciples, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, 
it bears more fruit. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, I die every day. Many of us today are living in an accelerated pattern of growth and change. And like Paul, we are dying every day. All we have to do is put the TV on and we definitely see how the world is, we could look at and think that things are dying, that ways that we knew don't no longer work, we're being challenged by things we don't, does not feel comfortable right now. And so the earth is definitely changing and a part of us is dying with what we think the way politics should be and the way we think that our politicians should act. But in reality, what's happened is we're getting moved out of our comfort zones and we're being challenged to grow in ways that we don't quite know what to do with yet. And so we fear death. And fear of change is also the fear of life itself. What do I mean by this? To be fully alive, we must be willing to let go, to change, to surrender into the moment without one thing, and the one thing that we've got to remember has to go along with that is resistance. We have to let go of resistance. The way that we think it should be. The way that we think others should be acting. Ken Blanchard, I don't know if you know him, but when I say his name, he's probably one of the most famous leadership development um, workers in this country. And he has developed programs for corporations for many years. And in order to be hired by Ken Blanchard, he does one thing. He insists on ha hiring flexible people who are not possessive about keeping the same strategies. He asks the questions, we are changing things here. What would you do with it? If your boss comes forward in his interviewing process, he asks them and he pretends like I am your boss and I'm coming in and telling you that everything that you thought the way that we were working as a team is going to change. What would you do? And they're like faced immediately and they have to think on their feet that quick because they're in, inter in an interview. And he wants to see how flexible are they to come up with immediately answers to that that would show that they themselves can teach it and be it and use the opportunities to grow constantly in every moment. Transitions are oftentimes seen as crises. And what is a crisis? Impending danger. Something we're unfamiliar with. Something that scares us. And so I looked then and thought, what does crisis really mean? I went to the Chinese because I happen to love the Chinese ways, Chinese ways of thinking and they have a brilliant way of sometimes defining a word. And so when I looked it up, the Chinese, the word crisis, is formed by a combination of two words, the symbols, which I can't read the symbols but I know what they mean. One word means danger, the other symbol means opportunity. They actually put in the word crisis, danger and opportunity. Another meaning is a poetic translation referring to the crisis as an opportunity riding on a dangerous wind. I like that one. Opportunity rising on a dangerous wind. I mean, it's poetic. I mean, but it makes crises sound like, wow, okay, it's just this, you know, floating <laughs> out there in the wind, not knowing quite where you are, but you know that you're going to land someday. And so what happens in that when you're riding on the wind? We come into a situation where um, we're in the void. None of us like the void. And so the poet Khalil Gibran always fascinates me. So I looked up to see what he said. He said pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Change, especially a major change or one that intrudes swiftly and unexpectedly into our lives often breaks the shell that encloses our understanding, even our sense of reality. And it throws us into the void. And what is the void? A darkness a seeming darkness. But I always remember 
my grandchildren. I remember my son, actually, Brendan, when he was a little boy, about eight years of age, we took him up to the mountains up here, and we went and uh, let them go to the gym mining. And all of a sudden, we had our little stones that we didn't think, you know, you look at them, they're dirty, and you have no clue what their value is, but you better believe the man behind the counter knows the value of what you're holding in your hand. And Brendan had a stone that we didn't know what it was, but it was dark and it didn't look very, it was big, but it didn't look like much to us. And then all of a sudden, the man started offering him money. Well, I'll give you $50 for that. Well, actually, I'll give you 100 it went up to four hundred dollars. I said, "Wow, what is he holding?" You know, it's like I got it, and of course, knowing this child of mine, there was no way he'd give up his stone. I didn't care what the man offered him, and he absolutely. I said, "It's up to you. Do you want to sell that stone to the man or not?" He said, "No." And what we found out, it was a gorgeous ruby. That later, once it was polished, it was absolutely stunning, and worth much more than that. And so, when I think of that story, I think, where do we find diamonds? Where do we find rubies? In the dark, in the caves. So what we have to do is become good cave dwellers. You know, we have to learn how to exist in the dark. And we need to learn that the darkness doesn't have to be so scary. You know, that we can find the light no matter where it is, because there is always light in the darkness. But we may have to go and find it. And so we enter that time called the void where nothing seems solid or definite. Most of us would like to avoid those feelings, myself included, when we're in the void. And yet, if we can stand up and say, yay, I'm in the dark. How many of you can definitely go, yay, I'm in the dark? Not many of us. But if we can learn to play with it, the darkness doesn't seem so scary. And so, it is through this dark and confusing days that we draw upon our deepest inner resources. Friends, family, ministers, children, bosses, anyone that could pass counselors, therapists, someone that can help us sometimes move through the dark. So we have to build trust. We have to trust someone sometimes to help guide us through that. And so we become, if we do that, into the silence, we become enormously powerful. It is a period called transition. And at the end, we find a new freedom and empowerment. It is the time of deep healing, growth, faith, love, and transformation. New freedom, empowerment. Who doesn't want that? Look at the seasons of nature. Just as the seasons are changing, the soul changes in, their, in our journeys, through time, through space. As every winter is followed by spring, so every death is followed by a rebirth. Every sorrow is followed by joy, and every void, once you enter into it, can be followed by a new beginning. In the biblical creation story, the earth was without form, and void. The darkness was upon the face of the deep. Creation begins with emptiness. It is from emptiness that new life emerges. The quickest way through the void is to embrace each experience fully and then let it go. Don't try to push the river. Don't attempt to rush your process or force anything to happen. Accept each day as it comes. Don't try and reconstruct the past. It doesn't work. Go back to the old way. It probably wouldn't work if you tried. Buddhist meditation teachers often refer to the sacred emptiness as the state of knowing one's own true nature. Taoist teachings emphasize emptying oneself in order to experience the Tao, the ultimate reality. Laos Lao Tzu, author of the Tao Te Ching, writes, in the pursuit of learning, every day something is inquired. In the pursuit of Tao, every day is something dropped. So I'm going to say today, in order to become who we really are, we must let go of everything that we're not. 
we must go into the void as a passageway to becoming truly alive and fully awake. As Lao Tzu has written, to die but not to perish is to be eternally present, to go through the challenges and come out stronger and more empowered. And how do we do this? By praying and meditating for regular periods each day. Trust in God, your neighbor, your friend, your own inner wisdom, even when you feel hopeless. Take care of yourself physically. Good food, rest, pay attention to your dreams. Don't forget your dreams. Create some type of ritual to symbolize your passage from the old to the new. Do your inner work and have faith. Remember, when change is thrust upon us, it scares us. When we seek change, it empowers us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.